The name Marshall Field is generally associated with the legendary shopping emporium that has been a Chicago landmark since 1868. For generations, Marshall Field's department store has catered to upscale women who are interested in the latest fashion and superior quality merchandise. The phrase, meet me under the clock, is known to Chicagoans to indicate the massive iron clock extending from the corner of the flagship store on Chicago State Street. While the Marshall Fields department store is synonymous with Chicago, it was the man behind the store who drove the city to become a world leader. It's hard to imagine a corner of Chicago today that has not been touched by the influence of this industrial giant. His donations and those of his descendants and business associates built and continue to fund Chicago's great cultural institutions, including the Field Museum of Natural History, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Shedd Aquarium, the Museum of Science and Industry, Millennium Park, the mosaic on the Notre Dame Library known as Touchdown Jesus. The steel mills of Chicago and Gary, Indiana were built by a syndicate including John D. Rockefeller, Fields, and other prominent financiers. Field used his considerable influence to have new mills built in Chicago area rather than in Pittsburgh, where the company was headquartered. Well, if it's true that he got the steel mills to be here instead of Pittsburgh, I would say that would be the biggest impact on history. Now, they're nothing today, but if you were looking at history, that's a big deal. Because, let's face it, no steel, no railroads. Fields became the largest shareholder and driving force behind the Pullman Palace Car Company, the leading employer in the city with over 6,000 employees producing $14 million of rail cars at the turn of the 20th century. As Chicago's largest individual landowner, he was responsible for the development of its shopping and financial districts. Chicago's elevated train, known by millions simply as the L, is a living example of Fields' related business interests. The Chicago City Railroad was financed with his money, built with steel from his mills, used train cars from his factory, and was configured to deliver riders directly into his store. The Merchants Loan and Trust Company, a bank he controlled for over 30 years, was the leading financial institution of its day and was so powerful that the Clearinghouse Committee of Bankers relied on field services to stabilize markets during time of banking crises. Marshall Field was born in 1834 and grew up on a family farm near Conway, Massachusetts. He learned responsibility at an early age, arising before dawn to milk the cows and work on the unending farm chores. It was a hard scrabble life farming the rocky New England soil. Field's oldest brother stood to inherit the farm from their father, and as the middle child, Marshall knew that he would have to do something else with the rest of his life. Consequently, in 1851, Marshall Field left the farm at age 17 to work as a store clerk in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. During the five years Field worked in Pittsfield, the population of Chicago, then a muddy frontier town on Lake Michigan, quadrupled to over 90,000 residents. Field had saved $1,000 and left for Chicago to seek his fortune. He was hired as a clerk at Cooley, Farewell, Wadsworth & Company in 1855. His bosses were so impressed with the ambitious young clerk that in 1860, they lent him the money to buy a junior partnership in the firm, now named Cooley, Farwell, and Company. In 1865, at the end of the Civil War, Field, then 31, took his bookkeeper, Levi Leiter, and joined Potter Palmer, the preeminent merchant in Chicago. Palmer retired two years later, selling his shares to the two young men. The firm was renamed Field, Leiter, and Company. Field learned some important lessons from Potter Palmer that would become the foundation of his great success. 
First, Palmer taught Field the importance of running a cash business and only extending credit to the most reliable and trustworthy clients. Second, Palmer instilled the basic notion that the lifetime value of a customer was far more valuable than the short-term profit that might be gained from squeezing the last nickel out of every transaction. Their store was the first to issue receipts and to accept returns regardless of the customer's reason over their competition. In 1868, Fields and Ladder opened their white marble palace on Washington and State Street to the amazement of Chicago's upper crust, who were enchanted with the fine goods and imported merchandise offered. But on October 8, 1871, in the O'Leary stable, the Great Fire began. The first alarm bells rang at 9.25 p.m., and the raging conflagration marched toward the store, consuming everything in its path. Unsure if the flames would reach the retail district, the partners moved swiftly to minimize the potential loss. By 3 a.m., nearly $200,000 of the finest merchandise had been moved to safety, along with a list of amounts owed by customers. Employees fought valiantly to save the structure, but the combination of flying embers, along with the failure of the city waterworks, proved insurmountable, and the store was burned to the ground. The store was reopened three weeks later in a train barn, and within two years, a new store was built at State and Washington Streets. Four years later, another fire burned the store to the ground, and once again, the firm moved swiftly to rebuild. The company opened a wholesale business to supply merchandise to retailers across the western United States. The wholesale business surpassed the retail operation and grew to be more than seven times the size of the store. Fields' intense personality was never more prevalent than when he faced heavy competition. He refused to be undersold and would go to great lengths to ensure customer loyalty, even if it meant buying merchandise from competitors and selling it at a loss. This is him. He had one son, Marshall II. And Marshall II either shot himself or was shot in something called the Everly House at age 34 or something like that. And my great-great-grandfather came from New England, which you know. So he was a true New Englander, which is waste not, want not. That's how you, you live. And when uh, his son was, was killed, this painting was being done by the same artist that did this one. All right? mm -hmm. If you look carefully at the cloth material on the left, he called the artist and said, my son is dead. Don't bother finishing the picture, just send me what you got. And so this picture is only two thirds no painted, kidding. which to me is a living example of waste not, why not? He said, okay, I don't have a son anymore. I'm not gonna spend any more money on this picture. The business became extremely lucrative, and even during the six years of depression after 1873, the firm was profiting over a million dollars per year. He had figured out the men made the money and the ladies spent it. All right, it's just that simple. Field invested the massive profits he earned from his retail and wholesale business into a wide variety of enterprises and land. He became one of the richest men in the country, and when he died in 1906, his estate was valued at nearly $150 million. I don't think that he was really interested in anything but Marshall Field and Company. He just needed something to do with his money. Uh -huh. The influence of one man is impossible to calculate. Hundreds of thousands of people have been employed in companies because of his investments. Visitors and residents of Chicago benefit from museums, parks, trains, and stores resulting from his vision and tenacity. One of Marshall Field's many gifts to the people of Chicago is the Field Museum of Natural History. He gave money to the Art Institute and all anything that you know, was part of the building of the city in the early days. 
mm -hmm. he was involved with. But the Field Museum was his biggest thing, and uh, he just got beat up into doing it. Oh yeah, he didn't want to do it. And all of his friends came down and said, you can't be a cheap so-and-so, you got to do this. My father hated having the Field Museum the Field Museum, so he told him to change the name and just call it the Chicago Natural History Museum, which they did. And all the cab drivers and all the people of Chicago got really pissed, so they put it back on again. The name Marshall Field may conjure images of elegant department stores, but his lasting influence and impact is in making Chicago an economic powerhouse, a cultural mecca, and a bustling metropolis where millions of people enjoy the fruits of his labor. Thank you.